<coughs> Hello, everybody. I'm Hans de Witt. I'm a professor emeritus and distinguished fellow at the Center for International Higher Education at Boston College, uh, and uh, have been working in the field of internationalization of higher education over the past uh, over 40 years, uh, both as a uh, a practitioner and as a scholar, and so you can call me a practitioner scholar, uh, even although in the last uh, 10 years, mainly focusing on the scholarly academic uh, part of internationalization of higher education, uh, following trends and issues and uh, making uh, them uh, put into practice both as an advisor and consultant, a teacher and so on. Uh, I do that with a background. Uh, of uh, being also from the state of the late 80s, early 90s, uh, to work in particular with my colleague Jay Knight uh, from Canada on the concept of what we mean with internationalization, why we're doing it, what are we doing, how are we doing it, and what is the outcomes, the impact of internationalization. Uh, and Today, I will talk about some of the global trends in international education, or what I would say, much more internationalization of higher education. Uh, are we, in the coming years, uh, going back to the old habits of what have been a very defining year, 2020, with the pandemic, but also with all kinds of other chances? Or are we seeing new forms of internationalization happening? Uh, around us. But we have to keep in mind in the context that internationalization is not a goal in itself, or is not a strategic approach that is independent of what is happening in the rest of higher education and what is not affected by the outside society we are living in. Geopolitical developments and tensions have come much more to the forefront, but have always played an important role in internationalization of higher education during the Cold War, uh, immediately after the, uh, the end of the World War and in between the two World Wars uh, in the 90s uh, to a certain extent, although then it was much more uh, looked at uh, uh, economic factors. Uh, but certainly recently uh, we have seen a revival of geopolitical development and tensions that impact higher education and its uh, internationalization. Tensions between uh, Europe and, uh, and Russia, China and the US, China and Australia, uh, within Europe, uh, uh, Brexit, all those kind of developments uh, directly have an impact on internationalization of higher education. Also, a challenge like increased competition for global talents. We see that there is a, still a shortage of highly skilled labor uh, to adapt to the uh, global knowledge economy and society we're living in. Uh, and that implies also that an impact having on uh, mobility of students, mobility of uh, faculty and mobility of other talents around the world. Uh, health concerns clearly manifested by the pandemic, uh, but also other concerns, uh, well-being, uh, etc. are very important key factors as well. You have to keep in mind, and of course, sustainability, environment, the whole climate change um, that impacts internationalization of higher education, or maybe in this case, we should say better, should impact internationalization of higher education, as well as also the other social sustainable development goals of the United Nations. We see nationalism in Europe, in uh, Asia, in uh, United States, uh, in Latin America, uh, that impacts also our perception of, uh, of international collaboration. And we see racism, Black Lives Matter, uh, uh, discrimination of Asians, but also uh, in, uh, in other parts of the world, we have to acknowledge that there is a lot of racist developments, uh, Latin America, for instance, Brazil, and uh, in Africa, and in Asia, uh, India, China, uh, uh, also impacting the way we collaborate and the way we are internationalizing. So there's a lot of things that we have on our plate um, uh, when we deal with internationalization and impacts us and should also be uh, uh, transferred by uh, in internationalization. So key questions are, how will internationalization be shaped by the momentous events of 2020 and before? How will this work, those working in internationalization respond to the challenges they face and how will they therefore contribute to shaping the future? 
If we look back over the past decades, we see that in education abroad in all its forms, uh, mobility of students for full degrees, mobility of students for credit mobility at the home institution, uh, certificate mobility, so language courses, summer programs, etc., uh, but also mobility of faculty, mobility of administrators, mobility of institutions, programs, projects, etc. They are much more synonymous with the agenda of the past than internationalization at home, the curriculum, the teaching and learning, the development of competencies, global citizenship development, etc. Uh, we see still that's at margin compared to the strong focus that has been over the years on the mobility side um, uh, of internationalization. We see also an increasing focus on international rankings and the, uh, as the rules of how they define uh, the international dimension in higher education, uh, uh, number of international students, number of international scholars, number of co-publications with international orders, uh, that's much more driving the agenda uh, uh, in influenced by the global rankings than the quality of education and the own mission and purposes of uh, institutions of higher education and national governments. Uh, as a result of that, we see not only a divide between the North and the South, uh, but also between universities classified as the top world-class universities and the others persisting still very strongly. Rankings define only something like 1,500 maximum of institutions around the world, and we have more than 30,000 institutions of higher education. So that's also a very small part. And since the notions and the concepts of rankings are very much defined by Western paradigms, it also is much more favoring the North than the South in uh, what is good in internationalization of higher education. So, over the years, internationalization has become more synonymous to competition and marketization than to its traditional values, cooperation, exchange, and service to society, which were much more driving the internationalization in the early uh, 20th century. Uh, and although it still, in words, is that whole traditional uh, uh, focus there and is also implemented, uh, it has been surpassed by much more emphasis on this competitive and market-oriented approach to internationalization. As a result of that, inequality and exclusiveness increased nationally and internationally, and in part due to elitist approaches to internationalization, because internationalization focused very much on mobility uh, and on the driving forces as expressed before, mainly benefits only a very small elite of students and faculty and institutions. Uh, approximately only 1% to 2% of students in the, in the world have a chance to be mobile for a semester or a year or for a full degree. Uh, there might be more in the Western world, uh, but still, uh, if you look in particular to the Global South, that is a very marginal aspect. Uh, and so elitism is a very important factor of internationalization if we look over the past decades. And recognition of the importance of addressing all aspects of education, so not only the mobility side, but also the curriculum and at home side, and integrating uh, internationalization as part of the university policy and strategy uh, is going very slow and even evenly increasing. So there are institutions that really have made a strong effort to become much more leading in a comprehensive approach to internationalization, but a very large majority of institutions, and I would say over 95% around the world, are seeing internationalization still in a very fragmented way uh, and uh, only as a revenue source or as a marginal aspect of the overall mission. So the chances are that internationalization at home, the second key component of internationalization, curriculum development, competencies, learning outcomes for all students, encounters, although in word more recognitions, lacks, but lacks action and strategic approach. 
So we pay lip services to the importance that we have to internationalize the curriculum. We pay lip service to the fact that we have not to be elitist and uh, uh, focusing on all students and all faculty. But the reality is that's still in a very early stage of development and is not seeing much progress over the past decades. Even although this whole notion of internationalization at home is already over 20 years old, uh, starting in Europe, but uh, finding much more emphasis elsewhere as well, are seeing, well, we have to stop this very elitist approach to internationalization by focusing on all students, also the ones that are not mobile. North-South partnerships is still strongly and uh, an equal. Uh, we still see that there's a power relationship and partnerships, in particular between the North and the South, but also between the world-class uh, universities and other types of universities. Uh, there's power of money, there's power of knowledge, there's power of access to uh, funding, there's power of access to uh, publications, uh, and that's still a very uh, important aspect. So the whole Western paradigm focus of internationalization expresses itself here very much. Internationalization is still mostly marginal, fragmented, and ad hoc. And so it is can be even at the central level, can be having access, but then it's still very uh, fragmented ad hoc. Uh, most cases even not uh, present at the central level, but much more initiatives by individual professors or individual departments and not systemic. It's not integrated in the overall mission of higher education. So internationalization is still seen as something separate, where if it is comprehensive and integral, it has to address all aspects of, international, uh, of, of the university, human resource development, academic affairs, research, student well-being, uh, departments, uh, disciplines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but we don't see that so much uh, happening. Uh, and that's uh, one of the main chances to make it uh, a much more uh, relevant approach. International station is also still much mainly institutionally driven. Uh, so institutions are still driving, although we see more governments having national policies. Uh, uh, Canada, uh, Denmark, uh, China, Japan, uh, uh, many countries, Russia, have now internationalization strategies. Uh, but they are also rather fragmented and ad hoc and mostly focused on this commercialization and marketization of international education. And there's no really a strong connection between what is happening at the institutions to the local, the national, the regional, and the global context of what is needed for society, for global society. So we have a need for change. We have to be the... Uh, we have to realize that this concern about an elitist, competitive, and market-oriented approach to internationalization still persists and is in danger to come back as a kind of uh, back to the old normal, where we urgently need more attention to the qualitative human dimensions of internationalization, global citizenship development, employability, improvement of the quality of research education, and service to society. All those are much more have to drive the internationalization agenda. And when we assess the internationalization results, we have to, as a result of that, not look at only at the outputs, the numbers, the quantitative, so how many students have we sent abroad, how many international students we have, et cetera, et cetera, how many programs, how many co-publications, but we have to in particular focus on what has been the impact of our strategy on the quality of education, research, and service to society as an institution. And that can be different from one institution to another because there's not one model that fits all. It can be different even within an institution between different disciplines, but that's why it's important you have to address much more clearly why you are doing it before you define what you're going to do and how you're going to do. Because only then you can also define clearly what the outcomes and the impact are. But one has to be realistic. Uh, we, we, we know that it's so much more work to be done uh, if we wanted to enter in a new phase of internationalization. Old habits are very difficult to change. 
Uh, even although, to take the example, the risk of dependence on income from international students and on a few countries uh, where they come from have become more manifest than ever during the pandemic. Uh, look at Australia as a very clear example of that. Look at Brexit and the UK and the implications of students coming from Europe. We see that uh, there is a high risk of dependence on uh, international students as an income source. We see high risk on dependence on certain countries. But we see not much lessons learned uh, uh, of that experience for the future, because still there's a trend to say, well, internationalization means we have to recruit more international students. The social impact of universities on a global scale is a key factor of the evolution of higher of high education. And it's one of the main lessons of the pandemic that this is important to address. Only if we collaborate in research and education together internationally, across borders, then really we can make an impact on society. But this is challenged by geopolitical tensions, national security and inclination of returning to old habits. Uh, and so we should not be too optimistic uh, if we just think that it will happen from itself. We have to be much more proactive in taking initiative to make this whole policy change. So looking forward, already in 2018, Jane Knight and I, in a forward for a book by uh, Laura Rumbley and Douglas Proctor on uh, the New Pathways and Practitioner Scholars focuses on experiences with internationalization. We said that universities now have responsibility, not only to ensure national prosperity, but also to contribute to the global common good. The creation of knowledge and its applications to improve the lives of pe all people all over the world and contributing to the growth of dynamic and sustainable global. International education, we said, can and should make a significant contribution to the agenda. We have to shape the next generation of world citizens, support the research and education, improving the life of the people on the planet. So internationalization, we called already then on as making a meaningful contribution to society. That's also why we extended, and we is not Jay Knight, because Jay Knight has been the leading person in defining her uh, working definition of internationalization, but a group of other people uh, based on a Delphi panel said in 2015 already, we have to give a much more direction, a normative direction to the internationalization as a uh, as a process. Uh, and we extended it by uh, the definition of Jane Knight by saying it has to be an intentional process and it has to be there improved to, to improve the quality of education and research uh, for all students and for all staff and making a meaningful contribution to society. That is important as the driving force because we cannot just say that internationalization goes by itself to incorporate international, intercultural, and global dimensions. It has to be an intention and it has to be for a solid purpose to move forward. And but the list can I in 2019 wrote in that context or so we have to align the practice of internationalization with human values and the gl common global good. It requires that those working in international higher education push the boundaries of their own and others thinking. That we have to challenge what we mean with being international as a university, a teacher, and a student. Uh, and uh, when we look into the future of internationalization. So I would say this is a message to say, we have to think out of the box of traditional internationalization and align international intercultural to other key values and themes. Uh, internationalization has developed, has become a much more broad conglomerate of uh, activities and terms and understandings, uh, different meanings, different concepts, different strategies, different approaches. Uh, but by that also that word internationalization in that sense has become a kind of too abstract term without much meaning. And we have to look into internationalization as, a, uh, as an instrument to really transform higher education in a global context. And so sometimes I even think that by that, the word internationalization has become counterproductive to express what we really want and need to do. And that might be something very much interesting to think about for the future. Should we maybe not 
move away from this narrow focus on internationalization as the concept for what we are doing. But that's a separate notion to uh, think about. So requirements for the next decade post COVID-19 is a return to a more cooperative and less market oriented approach. We have to take advantage of lessons learned in the pandemic. On the one hand, we realize more than ever that universities are not only an academic community, but also a living community. And so that they need to have the inspiration of being together inside and outside of the classroom, teachers, faculty, administrators, leaders. Uh, that has been a very important lesson to learn. You cannot replace the university by a digital community. But you can learn that the digital environment can enhance the quality of teaching and learning, can enhance the quality of research, can enhance the, uh, the quality of how we communicate with each other, uh, and also improve by that the sustainability uh, of our environment. Uh, if we do uh, use it for virtual exchange or collaborative online learning, and uh, to uh, make more use of the internet, to uh, bring people together. So it's not replacing, but incorporating the hybrid model into our teaching and learning. We have to focus on all students and all staff and not exclusively on a very small elite. We have to link internationalization to innovation and the needs of local and regional development. We have to see internationalization as a change agent, as my colleague Fiona Hunter always correctly says. And we have to link internationalization to the third mission, service to society and make global local and local global. That's the internationalization for society as Uwe Brandewer, Betty Lisk, Albert Jones and I have been advocating recently, which was already in the, in the updated definition of 2015, had to make a meaningful contribution to society. We have been expressing in even more than ever that it's needed uh, to focus on that. So key questions we have to ask ourselves to realize the transformative internationalization is who is engaged in internationalization within and beyond the institutions? Who are being left out? What might equitable and inclusive internationalization look like? And what types of leadership are needed to achieve it? How can internationalization be deployed as a tool of decolonization? Uh, certainly a very important topic and uh, Schoenstein and other people have been really much uh, paying the attention to this important topic. How can internationalization better uh, prepare all graduates and society to face future global challenges, including environmental dissemination and the decline of systems and institutions? What deeper systemic changes need to be made? Uh, what, how can internationalization ever strengthen, uh, be strengthened in order to make a meaningful contribution to society? What do reimagined mobility and blended mobility models look forward, look moving forward? What would be a more holistic approach to internationalization? And how might the digital transformation lead a new approach to internationalization? These are some of the key questions for being a transformative internationalization for the future, described also by us in the concluding chapter of um, the Handbook on International Education, the updated second edition of that handbook, which comes out uh, in the coming uh, period. So with that, I think I'll close uh, this talk and uh, look forward to uh, uh, discussions in the future with you and others, uh, and also hope that this has been contribution to your uh, work. Thank you very much.